Hello, Booktube, and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. I've been working on these books this week. Uh, the Two Towers from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The Histories by Herodotus. Uh, Exodus from the Bible. Uh, the Complete Stories of Oz. King Viet 1, 2, 3 and the grammar book by Marian Sosi Mercia and Diane Larson Freeman. So it's not been a great reading week for me, again. Um, and uh, maybe this will be a shorter video, although I hate to promise anything because sometimes even on the shorter videos I get rambling. So, um, Right, let, let's jump into it. Uh, Herodotus, the Histories, this, um, this is a little bit pathetic, but I, I only got two pages read. Now, uh, I, I want to offset by that by mentioning uh, again, uh, again, because I mentioned this last week, that I've um, started listening to the audiobook uh, of Herodotus. Uh, it's a different translation, obviously, because the Tom Holland translation I'm reading is not in the public domain. That's a new translation. But I, on YouTube, people have uploaded the public domain LibriVox Herodotus ones. And uh, in the audiobook this week, I think I finished up book one, did book two, and now I'm into book three. Um, and I've, I've been doing that as a way to keep the story fresh in my mind, uh, uh, keep the history fresh in my mind, because I'm, I've been making such pathetic progress on the written version. In, in the written version, uh, the uh, Darius is sending his forces out to conquer Athens. Now, I, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with this. I don't remember exactly from the histories I've listened to. Um, but I believe the great showdown between the Greeks and the Persians was with Xerxes. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with Darius's expedition. Um, th there is, I, yeah, I should actually know what happens here because I've, I've listened to a number of podcasts on this, uh, a couple podcasts on this. Um, the, uh, Donald Kagan's lecture on the Greek world by Yale, uh, Yale University Open Lecture Series and uh, Dan Carlin's King of Kings series. And in fact, uh, in these two pages, there's a scene that I remember from Dan Carlin's King of Kings series when the Persians come to Delos, well, where the, uh, the oracle is, the, the famous oracle of Delphi, I believe. Um, is that the same as Delos, actually? Or am I getting that mixed up? Anyways, there's some sort of oracle there. Uh, the, the local inhabitants run when they see the Persians coming. And the Persian general, uh, whose name is, what, Datis, uh, so not Darius himself, but one of his generals, says, yeah, you, you don't need to run. The king has expressly ordered me not to do you any harm. Even if he hadn't ordered that, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't dream of harming the birthplace of two gods. Uh, and then he uh, piled up 300 talents worth of frankincense on the altar and burned it as an offering to the gods. I believe Dan Carlin uh, in his King of Kings podcast describes this as massively over-tipping the gods as, as part of the Persian PR campaign. Um, saying that when, when we're around, when the Persians are around, this god is going to get even more than he's used to. Uh, talk, this was part of his theme about talking about how the Persians were not the Assyrians. Uh, they, they, were, they were not simply cruel conquerors. They, they were running a PR campaign as they did their conquering. So, that, yeah, that was interesting, but I only got two pages read. I, I, I have been keeping up on the audio book. The grammar book as well, I, I only got two pages read. Um, so, still talking about the uh, articles here, definite and indefinite articles. It, it is interesting. Um, I, 
I'm not really sure how much of this I'm going to hold in my long-term memory after I finish this book, which has been a, a concern of mine all along reading this book because I'm, I was, I'm reading it for professional development, like with the hope I'm going to take some of this knowledge with me. But uh, yet yeah, talking about when we use a, uh, when we use the, and when we don't use any of them and, and, the, and the different word, the, the different rules that accompany them. And, and she, she talks, the, sorry, she, the two authors, so they, they talk about the shift that happens over time where some unique common nouns become proper nouns, like the Sudan becomes Sudan. Um, the Brookfield Zoo becomes Brookfield Zoo. Uh, they also talk about how Earth can be either Earth or the Earth. So it, when we talk about the list of planets, we say like um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. But when we talk about things in relation to our physical environment, we say the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth. Um, and yeah, it, it, they, they go into more detail. We talk about how earth is used in poetic senses. So there's there's a lot of interesting information here about when we use articles and when we don't. Um, and like I said a couple reading vlogs back, um, th this is something that's very confusing to my students and has been something as a teacher that I've struggled to get my head around a coherent system to explain it to my students. So it, it's useful stuff, but I, I haven't made a lot of progress this week. And then speaking of languages, uh, King Viet one two three. All right, I actually the authors probably don't intend this to be pronounced one two three, right? Mot hai ba. Still, still working on the alphabet. Um, I'm, I'm making, I'm going to be making slow progress on this book. Um, I, I have been dutifully practicing the alphabet once a day, but, but I don't feel like I've gotten it yet. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be making slow progress on this book for the foreseeable future, um, partly because I'm doing other things. I'm, my New Year's resolution was to get back into studying Vietnamese, something that I have tried to do periodically during my stay in Vietnam, but, but on the whole, have made a really terrible job of considering how long I've been living in Vietnam. Um, so I'm doing Pimsleur's uh, Vietnamese, uh, uh, the, the, the audio recordings. I'm doing Duolingo. Uh, I'm doing Quizlet. Uh, and I think, I think if I complete some of that other stuff, then I'll devote more attention to this book. Um, the other thing is um, the the recordings for this book are online, so you, you can go to the website uh, where they, where is that listed? It's listed somewhere in the book where it tells you where to go on the website. I don't actually remember the address anymore because I just have it bookmarked on my browser permanently now. Uh, but you, you go to the website and you have the recordings, but the recordings only say the letters of the alphabet they don't give the example word. So the example word is written, but you, you, you can't listen to it. So earlier this week, I had my Vietnamese wife uh, read through this uh, with all the stuff that's not on the publisher's audio. Um, she read it through in somewhat of a quiet voice. Would have been nice if she would have done it with more volume, but, but she's not, uh, you know, she's not a professional voice actor, uh, voice recorder. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to, I've been listening to her recordings. I've uploaded it onto, onto YouTube earlier this week. I'll link to it down below. And I've been listening to that myself twice a day to supplement the audio from the publishers. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue doing it going forward. It's one of those gray areas in terms of copyright. Um, I mean, I, I, I view it as something that's beneficial. 
um, because the publishers didn't include it. I'm including useful supplement supplementary material, but there's no guarantee that the publishers will view that through a benevolent eye. So with the future pages, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, make my mind up with that when I come to it. All right. Uh, the Complete Stories of Oz. So uh, last week's weekly reading vlog, I had almost finished off TikTok of Oz. I had six pages left to go, which I finished off. So I completed uh, TikTok of Oz. And I made a video uh, reviewing it in which I, I rambled on for, I believe, that was 45 minutes, which is pro probably way more time than these odd stories deserve. I mean, you, you, could almost, you could almost read the entirety of TikTok of Oz in the time that it would take you to listen to the video I made. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm long-winded. I uh, can't help myself. Um, and then The Scarecrow of Oz is the next book um, that I've started. That's book number nine. Uh, Dane uh, Cobain from Dane Reads and I are doing this as a buddy read. So uh, we do one book every two weeks. Dane's a much faster reader than me, so he's always ahead of schedule, at least in his reading. He, he actually edits his videos, so sometimes his videos get posted a little bit behind schedule, but his reading is ahead of schedule. Um, but I, I actually only read eight pages, which means I've, I've got to finish up this book next week. It's, it's only about 100 pages. Yeah, only about 100 pages. This is, this is what I've got to finish up. So that, that's going to be my reading for this coming week. So... Um, Scarecrow of Oz is starting out with two characters, Cap Captain Bill, spelled Captain Bill, and Trot, a young girl, who I believe are from L. Frank Baum's other series, uh, the Sea Fairies series, which is a series he tried to start off when he was trying to end uh, his Oz books uh, a, f a few books back. And I know about this via Wikipedia. I've not actually read the books. Um, the, the main reason being I, I haven't been able to find them out in Vietnam. They, they are on Project Gutenberg, but um, I, I don't like reading whole books off of my computer screen. So um, what I'm, for, for the moment, uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that this will make sense. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will because uh, I, th I think a lot of people who read the Oz stories straight through don't bother with the other books. Uh, so it, uh, following the adventures of Trot and Captain Bill as they get sucked into a mysterious whirlpool and are in a dark cave. And uh, that, that'll be my reading project, project for this coming week is to finish that up so I'm on schedule with Dane. Okay, um... Next, The Two Towers. Uh, this has been the bulk of my reading this week, and the main reason is uh, this, this is the smallest, most portable book I've got. You know, you can compare these. So when I'm reading at dinner or when I'm grabbing something quick to read while, you know, I'm waiting at the elevator, uh, this is what I grab. And so I uh, did from page 876 to 960, 84 pages this week. Uh, as always, I'm going to assume everyone is familiar with the plot uh, from the movies or because most people have read the book. Most people have read the book. A lot of people have read the book. Uh, everyone has seen the movies. So it's Sam and uh, Frodo and Gollum. Uh, traveling up into Mordor, which were the parts of the movies that I always was boring to me. Um, it's all right in the book. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting detail to keep me interested. 
Uh, and, you know, in the movies, uh, I always felt like there was way too much focus on the emotions. Like, oh, Frodo is so tired. Oh, Sam has to cheer him up. Um, in the book, for better or for worse, that doesn't get as much focus. The focus is on the landscape. So Tolkien is describing the the road on which they're journeying, the things that they're journeying through or up. So it talks about the crossroads where there's a, like a circle of pine trees that they pass through and the road going up and under a rock and and the the city of the ring rays uh which they see from a distance uh and a lot of descriptions about the mountain and the path and stuff like that and as as i've been saying all along with this series i have a difficult time visualizing a lot of this stuff um and have to fight to keep myself from tuning out a little bit during some of these descriptions, which I have struggled, trouble visualizing. Um, but then we get to the part with the spider, uh, Shelob's lair. Shelob mean, meaning is the name of the giant spider. Now, I think... How did this work in the movie? Did, did, did they change this to the third third movie? I don't remember. Uh, I know in the, the animated Rankin-Bass ones, they definitely had this one in, in The Return of the King, right? Peter Jackson, I forget how he arranged the material. But in, in the books, it's right at the end of The Two Towers. Now, I have always loved giant spiders. Um... In, in, in kind of a weird way. Like, I, like I'm, a, I'm a bit of an arachnophobe. I, I find spiders really creepy and terrifying. So because of that, uh, somewhat counterintuitively, or, or maybe not counterintuitively, uh, I love horror stories about giant spiders because it, it, it really creeps me out and, and you know and, and kind of like the way that you like being scared a little bit the, the, the way that people like creepy horror stories when they're in a certain mood um and yeah that that those scenes written with shelob the giant spider are are written i mean they, they they could just be like they were in a horror book uh in a scary monster book you know it's just is this they're going into the lair, it's getting dark, they get lost, they don't know what's going on, and then it, then it switches to the perspective of the spider and talks about how she was there from ancient times and had so much malice and uh, all, all the evil stuff that the spider creature had been up to. And then we switch back so that they, they see the spider creature approach them and they, they run and the spider runs after them and they, they realize then that the spider's just toying with them and, and they can see the spider just getting ready to pounce on them. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it goes on. I'm, I'm not going to recount the whole scene from the book, but it, it's just done in such a creepy way that shows that Tolkien could easily have been a scary story, uh, you know, like a horror writer if he had wanted to be. Um, of course, that's not what he's famous for. This is just one scene inserted into a larger work. Um, but it, it, yeah, he, he, he can really do those creepy scenes well when he wants to. I actually, uh, I only have 10 pages left to go in this book before I finish it. So uh, I'll, I'll be finishing up it up within the next couple days and then I'll be reviewing it uh, sometime this next week, I imagine, uh, unless... Some, something happens, you know, like unless I get terribly busy. Which, which could happen. I've, I've got a uh, busy week coming up, but I'm going to try and make time for that. Okay, and then Exodus. So I uh, got 10 pages read of Exodus um, from page 82 to 92 in my Bible. Uh, and, and that is... 
chapters 21 to 29. So, yeah, the we are up to a part in the story now where we are away from the narrative and we are listing off the laws, which, um, you know, it's sometimes easy to forget when you, when you think of the book of Exodus, you think of the stories, right? The, the, the 10 plagues, the, the great sea parting, the story of Moses. Um, and then sometimes you forget, or at least I sometimes forget that this is part of the Pentateuch, uh, otherwise known as the books of the law. I, I, Sorry, I, I had to catch myself there. I, 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 w I almost said this is what's known as the Pentateuch, which means the books of the law. But I, actually, I, I don't think that's what it means. I think Pentateuch is Greek for five books, right? Or am I wrong? But it, uh, often called the books of the law because there's a lot of law in here. Now, I, I remember as a, a young adolescent reading through this and being a little bit confused what the structure of these books were because it seemed to me that there was narrative then there was chunks of law and then there was narrative and there was chunks of law narrative chunks of law etc um and i'm encountering that same confusion here again there there are headings in my bible the jerusalem bible um but I don't know if this is going to make more sense when I'm all the way through it or not. Exodus seems to be chunks of law mixed in with the narrative. Leviticus seems to be, I think, all law and no narrative. And then Numbers, again, is uh, law and narrative mixed in with each other. And I think Deuteronomy is mostly law with some narrative. But we'll, but we'll see. maybe once I've read all the way through it, I'll, I'll look back on it and see if I can figure out what the structure is. So, chapter twenty-one is uh, laws concerning the slaves, laws concerning homicide, blows and wounds, laws concerning the theft of animals, offenses demanding uh, compensation, the violation of a virgin. Uh, Sorry, sorry, that getting into chapter two. Chapter twenty-two is the theft of animals, offenses uh, demanding compensation, violation of a virgin, chapter twenty-two. Chapter twenty-three, justice, duties towards your enemies, blah blah blah. That stuff is all interesting as far as it goes. I mean it is just lists of laws, but it or it's it's actually I don't know if law is the right word. It almost seems more like guidelines. I mean, it wouldn't be laws uh, the way we consider laws today. For, for example here, um, what's an example? Actually, it, it varies. Uh, some of these do seem to be laws. Some of these more, more seem to be guidelines within which a legal code would be worked out. Uh, for example, it, it, it says, you know, if, if if this is the offense, then they must pay compensation that's worked out to be fair. So, something like that. So how it works is worked out to be fair is going to be needed to be decided by a judge and an arbitrator and stuff like that. So it's not like a, a legal code like we would think of it today where, you know, you have to pay this much for this offense, this much for this offense. Yeah, you, you get what I mean. But it, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, it's, it's a, some, some of this has, you, you read it and you think, oh, boy, that's, um, that's, that's, not, that's not what the modern values would be. And other parts you read it and you're like, yeah, that's actually, that's actually a really good idea. I, I wish society like that would, would be more like that nowadays. Um, but it's interesting just comparing these values here in Exodus to our values in terms of the civic and criminal stuff. But then we get into the priestly stuff. Uh, and this, this is where I really struggled. 
So it's talking about the tabernacle, how the tabernacle is going to be built, how the ark is going to be built, how the table for the offering is going to be set up, how the lampstand is supposed to be structured, the different fabrics for the tabernacle, uh, how the veil is going to be made. And then it talks about the priestly vestments. So there's something called the ephod, uh, which the priests are going to wear. And then there's the pectoral of judgment, which I guess is a priestly garment worn across the chest. So there's all these descriptions about how all this stuff is going to be constructed. And I'm, I'm having flashbacks to seventh grade again when I was reading this for my nightly devotions as a seventh grader. Now, I, I mentioned this before in a previous video, I think. Uh, you know, being brought up as a conservative Christian, I would read one chapter of the Bible every night for devotions. And um, it's it that is too much of a burden to put on the Bible because the there's, there's no way you would get any sense of spiritual devotion or spiritual enlightenment from these passages. You, you know, you, you read the sections about, okay, the tabernacle has to be this long by this long, and the fabric has to be made out of this, and you have to embroider cherubs on it. Uh, and it, it's, it's just nothing useful uh, or enlightening in, in terms of modern life or your spiritual development. Um, I, 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 un I understood, of course, uh, that uh, this was the old law that God had given uh, to the Jews according to the Christian interpretation of this, and that it was in the Bible for historical reasons uh, so that we can, Christians can know what the old law was, so that we can appreciate the difference between the old and the new covenants. Um, but I, I, you know, I sometimes wondered why we as modern day Christians had to read it. Um, probably most modern day Christians don't actually read it, huh? But, but, but that's, that's another subject. Um, but the other thing is I really had difficulty visualizing this. So, you know, when, I, when I'm reading about the, the tabernacle, uh, l let me just read this section. The tabernacle itself you are to make with tin sheets of fine twined linen of purple stuff, violet shade and red, and of crimson stuff. You are to have these sheets finely brocaded with cherubs, uh, the length of a single sheet is to be 28 cubits, its width 4 cubits, and all the sheets of the same size. Um, five of the sheets must be joined to each other, and the other five similarly. Okay, okay so five sheets are joined to each other. Uh, how are they joined? I, I think this is the next one. You must attach loops of violet stuff to the border of the last sheet in one set and do the same for the border of the last sheet in the other set. You are to put 50 loops on the first sheet, matching them one by one, 50 loops on the border of the last sheet in the second set. You are to make 50 gold clasps to draw the sheets together. And this way, the tabernacle will be a unified whole. Um, yeah, or, I mean, I'm, I'm just really having a hard time visualizing what that looks like. The, oh, the other thing was the lampstand. Okay, so you are to make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand must be of beaten gold, based in stem. Its cups... Calax and petals. Yeah, what, what does that even mean? Are calax and petals like a style of lamp cup? And, and what, what is a cup when it means a lamp? I mean, this, this is all one thing, right? It must be, of, must be of one piece with it, so it's all one piece. 
Six branches must extend from the sides of it, three one side and three from the other. Uh, the first branch is to carry three cups shaped like almond blossoms with its calyx and petals. Yeah, and it, it just goes on like that. And I, I could not visualize what, uh, what this was supposed to look like. Now, I, I, I just got talking, done talking about the Lord of the Rings and how I couldn't visualize the landscapes in here. So maybe this is just my problem. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, I was wondering when I was reading in the Lord of the Rings if, you know, too many years of not reading, where, where I've been, you know, doing YouTube or watching movies, has destroyed my ability to visualize the written word. But then coming back to this, I, I realized that this was a problem I've always had as a reader. Um, you know, like dialogue is okay, plot is okay, but long descriptions in which I have to visualize it in my mind's eye, I really get confused and, and my brain switches off. And it's, it's really hard to get that brain to switch back on, which is, I'd be embarrassed to ad admit this, but the, the descriptions of the lampstand, the descriptions of the tabernacle, the descriptions of the priestly garments, I really struggled with that this week. And I, I did my best as a diligent reader. Every time I realized that my mind was turning off, I would go back to the top of the paragraph and start again and try and really focus myself. But it, I was just such slow progress. Um, what I did do, though, is, um, you know, the Internet is a wonderful thing. And, and uh, years ago when I was reading this as a seventh grader back in the early 90s, there, there was no internet. But nowadays, uh, go to the internet and you can look up the tabernacle and you can look up the lampstand and you can look up the ephod and the pectoral and you, you can look at pictures of what people think they look like. And then you can, I can use those pictures to help me visualize it and go back and, and do this. So that's, that's what I had been doing. I mean, the lampstand, once I looked that up, see, I, I had been picturing, I had been picturing a, like a lamp, like, you know, Aladdin and the magic lamp, like, you know, something just this, this round thing filled with oil. So when it was talking about all the cups and all the, the, the branches, I, I was thinking, okay, what, what does this look like? But, but you look it up and it, they, they've got a picture of a, of, a, of a menorah. So, you know, something with a straight stem and then three stems branching out from it. Um, so that makes much more sense once I looked it up. Yeah, I don't know. You know, if, if I was designing my own Bible, um, I think I would put in a lot more footnotes um, and some pictures. Uh, you know, put, put the pictures right in the Bible. Say, so, you know, maybe it looked like something like this. And uh, have, have a lot of maps. Sorry, the, the maps is, is um, not connected to this section. That's just something I've been thinking about. Uh, but, you know, you, you know how they have those landmark editions of ancient texts, like the landmark Herodotus? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great to have like a landmark Exodus, where you, you'd have the maps, you'd have the pictures of uh, everything, so, so that you don't have to go to the internet to find out what they're talking about? Anyways, uh, that, that's what I've been working on in Exodus, uh, and I've got a lot more of that to go. <laughs> uh, and then Leviticus, where it's going to be a lot more priestly rules and descriptions. I am committed to this project. I'm, 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 I will plow my way through, but it's going to be rough going for a while before I get back to the narrative. Okay, and that's all for this week.